if you'd lived your entire life in a cave and never seen the outside world. From reading the Quran or the Bible, you might get the impression that the stars are merely numerous decorations that God placed in the sky simply to impress us. And when you left your cave for the very first time and looked up at the stars, you would be impressed. And you might think the scripture had told you the truth, for such beauty could pull anyone down to their knees, even an atheist like myself. For the religious, the mere mention of the stars in scripture is evidence enough that the God of the Bible or Allah of the Quran knew all about them, but the religious never seemed to notice that in a thousand pages God couldn't and didn't tell us one damn thing that isn't obvious to the naked eye at a single glance. For when the poetry is put aside, all that the holy books really say is that there are many stars and they have great beauty. Yet a child could tell you that. Think about it. A child could tell you as much about the stars as God did. I believe in America it's called a flimflam, a deception. In this case, the dazzling of another's mind with words, giving the impression of knowledge without any informational content at all. But the religious can't see that. They've been blinded by the light. For an omnipotent God's plan to proceed, for the struggle between good and evil to play out exactly as described in the holy books, all that's required is for the existence of the earth and the sun. One star is all that's needed, although a truly all-powerful God could simply make the light and heat that we need rain down from the sky without any obvious, rational or explicable cause, or he could make it so that we don't need light and heat at all, but of course, the religious imagination isn't free enough to grasp this. They'll say, the Lord moves in mysterious ways, a cunning bit of religious programming that just happens to stop any curiosity before it can pull out of the station. But for argument's sake, let's say God, for his own mysterious reasons, wants it all to run via nuclear fusion and nucleosynthesis in the sun and photosynthesis on earth. He still only needs one star and one planet. Anything beyond that would be window dressing. In such an empty universe, it would indeed seem that the earth was a special place and the focus of creation, adding tremendous weight to the earth-centered religious beliefs. But by that same token, if there were two suns, that would bring the earth-centered religions into doubt. That would be doubly true if there were three suns, and for each additional sun after that, the doubts grow. If there were only one world, it might be unreasonable to say that life exists on that one world by chance alone. For atheistic ideas to have any support, for it to be true that life arose by pure coincidence of conditions and elements, there must be more than one sun more than one roll of the dice. A universe with two suns helps the atheistic argument, but not by much. Three suns would offer only a slight improvement upon that. But current estimates, linked to the research in the sidebar, suggest that there are 70 sextillion stars in the observable universe alone, and very good reasons to believe that the actual universe is far, 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 far larger. 70 sextillion. Each one of these countless chances for life is an argument in favour of atheism, at least in its opposition to the earth-centred religions of Christianity and Islam. Now let's look at what the holy books say about the stars. First of all, Christianity, via Genesis chapter 22, verse 17. But in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Christian apologetics will say this passage proves that the Christian God knew how many stars there are, but all it proves is that they don't know what proof is, or they're relying on you to not know. Look at the passage again. Why is it there? What is it saying? In essence, all it actually says is, worship me, and I will make you so numerous, so countless, that nothing can stand in your way. It should be obvious why a passage like this is in a holy book of a proselytizing religion, intent on converting as many people as possible. All religions want to be the only religion. All people want to belong to the biggest gang. It's a hideous synchronicity. 
It makes us feel safe, which we must feel to be happy. And if religion can make you feel safe and happy, you're more than halfway in its pocket. It would, after all, be pretty dumb to write in a holy book, Worship me and there won't be enough of you to make up a soccer team, let alone defend yourselves in a perpetual war zone with few resources. Now think for a moment about the concept of countlessness, that which is beyond count, and ask yourself if you wanted to convey a huge number, how would you do it to the people of the Bronze Age used to counting only a few goats? One might be tempted to use metaphors like trees in a forest, raindrops in the sky, or blades of grass in a field, but these things would be outside of the everyday experience of those living in and around the deserts of the Middle East thousands of years ago. What other imagery might be of use? It's simple poetry, obvious imagery that can be found in many other works of fiction. Anyone who has been to the deserts of the Middle East at night knows that the number of stars visible to the naked eye vastly exceeds the number seen from most of the locations on the planet. It's obvious why the Bible conveys countlessness via such imagery. What could be more numerous to the uneducated mind than the stars and the sand? But if you think that passage is conveying an actual number, you should note that God has failed his followers miserably. For there are only a couple of billion Christians, so God has not multiplied your seed as the stars of the heavens. Far from it. He was off by a factor of over a trillion, and in mathematical terms this is called fail. For 70 sextillion is actually ten times the number of all the grains of sand on all the beaches and in all the deserts of earth. So the poetry of Genesis chapter 22 cannot be considered compelling proof that the Abrahamic God knew how many stars there actually are. It is literally no wonder, no cause for wonder, that when trying to convey countlessness, the Bible links stars and sand. And as for the Quran, in Surah 67 verse 5 it says, And we have from old adorned the lowest heaven with lamps. And we have made such lamps as <coughs> missiles to drive away Satan's. <laughs> so there you have it. The Quran says the stars are lamps to chase away devils. So much for science in the Quran. But there's something else I'd like you to consider. Both holy books refer to the stars and the sun. Why? Obviously part of the reason is the need to explain the pretty lamps, <coughs> stars, but why in particular do the holy books talk about the stars and the sun? Why do they never, not once, tell us that the stars are suns and that our sun is just an ordinary star like countless others? You know why. It's because whoever wrote the Bible just like the people of the time, didn't know. Everyone wants to know where they came from. That search, when conducted honestly, will lead you to the stars. And if you don't know what a star is, you're either very, very young, or you're just not trying. I'm not saying there was no creative intelligence behind this universe. But if it existed at all, it was a scientist, a physicist, not a magician. Its tools were physical forces, not people. Such an intelligence would not be as unintelligent or as angry as the supernatural and indeed unnatural God of the Bible and the Quran, who flies off in a homicidal, sadistic rage if you simply doubt him, having supposedly built a universe that inspires more and more doubt the more you learn about it. Quickness to anger decreases with understanding. And judging from the threats of the hot-headed Abrahamic God, he didn't understand very much at all. The very beginning, the one true gap that remains, may always be a gap, always leaving space for belief of a rational kind. Science will never take that away, and may even help you understand your Creator better than you do now. But by worshipping such an unworthy, blood-drenched and primitive idol, you insult whatever Creator there may have been. 
Atheists, meanwhile, cannot believe the creator of this universe could be so immature. And in that sense, atheists give that creator, if they ever existed, more respect than a Christian or a Muslim ever could. We cannot believe in your God. We cannot believe in a God that makes knowledge an obstacle to belief. We cannot believe in a God who is obsessed with one species on one planet orbiting one star. Write a new holy book, put in there just one page, and on that page simply put a question mark, and then we can talk about it. Until then, the stars are on our side.